Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to uh, this Friday morning event, uh, brought to you by Plymouth Marine Laboratory uh, in association with IOC UNESCO, uh, with the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network and the IAEA. This morning we're going to be discussing uh, topics around ocean acidification, climate and society, mitigation and adaptation opportunities and challenges towards addressing SDG 14.3. Um, as we're aware, rising carbon dioxide is impacting ocean ecosystems and, and dependent coastal communities worldwide. This event will highlight how action-driven global scientific and cross-sectoral collaboration supports interested parties on mitigation, adaptation and preparedness strategies from local to global to the combined impacts of ocean acidification, ocean warming and deoxygenation. We've assembled uh, an illustrious panel uh, to give you their thoughts and ideas and around this concept and topic, so I'm very much looking forward to uh, to hearing their ideas. Um, I'll just briefly introduce you to the panel, uh, and then they will uh, they will then provide you with the, the information. So, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Naira Chaltu, the Associate uh, Professor of Marine Chemistry at the National Institute of Oceanography and Fisheries here in Egypt. We'll then move to uh, Dr. Jana Friedrich, Head of uh, Radio Ecology Section at the IAEA Marine Environment Laboratories. We then have Dr. Nick Hardman Mountford, uh, a diplomat in marine science working in ocean, climate and resource governments as part of the Commonwealth Secretariat. And then welcome uh, Tarika Tamari, Director of Coastal Fisheries, uh, Director of the Coastal Fisheries Division at the Kiribati Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources Development. Introduce you to Sarah Kapnick, PhD, uh, Chief Scientist of NOAA. And last but not least, Julian Barbare, Head of Marine Policy and Regional Coordination. Uh, section of the Internet Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, IOC, uh, as part of UNESCO. So as you can see, a very well-informed panel who will hopefully be able to guide us and steer us through the, the topic this morning. So without more ado, I would like to pass the floor over to our first speaker. Now I'd like to invite you to uh, make your intervention. to give me the chance to uh, give a short brief about the ocean acidification impact and climate change impact on African countries. Okay, thank you. Um, this, uh, my talk today is about the ocean acidification and climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies in Egypt. Also, um, African continent uh, just, in, just contributing to just 4% of the global emission of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, but it's the most, one of the most uh, impacted con uh, continents all over the world. About 32 countries, coastal, country, coastal countries along the whole coast of Africa, and they showed the, most, the lowest resilience to the impact of climate change and ocean acidification. It's the coastal countries goes, when you go to the strongest red colors, you show how uh, it, these countries are impacted and how are they less resilient. Africa is unique by its situation. It's located in the middle of the world and it's surrounded by different seas and oceans which represented a different habitats. It's um, um, surrounded by Red Sea to the east and Indian Ocean, which are the habitats which represented the habitats for coral reef and the most impacted parts by the climate change and ocean acidification. 
for the West Africa is surrounded by Atlantic Ocean and the upwelling area for which is a very rich area with fisheries production. And also this area is impacted highly by the impacts of climate change and um, acidification. Uh, the coast of Africa is extended for more than 26,000 miles and um, although uh, uh, Egypt has the highest number of fleets in the Mediterranean and it's the biggest country for having the, the highest number of fleets in the Mediterranean going for fishes activity for the Mediterranean and the western coast of Africa but Africa as a whole own just 1.2% 1 of the whole total world fleets in addition, the impact of different stressors, in addition to climate change and ocean acidification, um, caused the, a lot for the African continent. Uh, the illegal fishes contribute to losing more than one billion dollar for the African income. Although the African continent has more than 100 ports, but only 707 ports are. Um, um, revised African maritime transport cartels. African uh, imports, Africa imports and exports more than 90% of its resources, uh, but it's actually uh, the African, regarding the African uh, Union Integrated Maritime Strategy 2050, they promote the blue, based on this, they promote the blue economy. This diagram show how climate change, ocean acidification, pollution and other stressors impacted the African income. First of all, they all together change, causing a change for habitat and species in invasion and local ex extensions. They also has an effect, have an effect on phylogeny by changing the producer's pluming, changing in the life cycle of the marine habitats changing on the uh, predators and uh, prey and predators interaction. They also affect the physiology of the habitats by changing the, the photosensors activity in the marine environment, changing in the biological key parameters that, uh, such as gross reproduction, mortality. In addition, the human impact from over exploitation and pollution impacted the structure and, structure and dynamic of the food web, and they all led to changes in the Africa income. The coastal ocean system are important for the economics and livelihood on African countries, and climate change and ocean acidification will increase the challenges from existing stressors, which are the overexploitation, habitat degradation, loss of biodiversity, salinization, pollution and coastal erosion and other extreme events. That makes it an, a great need to work in the framework of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal for food safety and security and smart agricultivation, moving to uh, bio prospections and coastal urbanization and conservation for greening blue economy and integrated flora and fauna cultivation and hybridization of green and blue economy and this could be achieved only through mitigation and adaptation. For mitigation, I'm sorry. Okay, this diagram shows how Africa goes for, for the whole continent for mitigation, their sector for mitigation and adaptation since 2015. And one of the best achievements for Africa is the achievements we have for mitigation in energy, decreasing carbon, carbon dioxide emission for the atmosphere. Since Africa has a big resources for uh, renewable energy, for moving sources, renewable sources of energy, so, uh, such as wind, solar, um, hydro energy, geothermal energy, and also there is a lot of activities to moving to uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen energy. That's why we have African countries uh, achieved a lot in mitigation um, strategies. In addition, there's a, this is this all for the adaptation for agriculture, mediculture, moving to green energy, a green strategy for moving to blue and green biotechnology for fisheries production and aquaculture. 
This is some example of what we achieved in Africa actually for our mitigation adaptation strategy, moving this, this um, I, I don't know how to point, but this is an example for the wind farm and solar energy farm in Morocco, also for uh, moving to another techniques for fisheries, uh, fisheries, uh, fisheries uh, the techniques in, uh, in um, Kenya and Ghana. Uh, in addition to uh, moving to green biotechnology and blue biotechnology for fisheries aquaculture. This is a policy level recommendation for the African continents. Um, actually, before I move to this slide, um, Africa needs more than $3 trillion to achieve the adaptation, okay, to achieve adaptation and mitigation strategy for the next decade. Uh, for the policy level, we need to support outreach and communication on climate change and ocean acidification and the vulnerability of coastal communities through educational program, including training and capacity development for decision makers, national administration and NGOs. Update policies, regulation and standards to recognize the role of human activity in affecting climate change, ocean acidification and society either locally or globally. Identify and address social, ecological risks and resilience, which can be used to design mitigation strategies locally through a variety of management measures. For research, we need more data, more information, more cooperation projects between regional and interregional uh, countries to achieve more data about ocean impact of ocean acidification and climate. And data is only a way for researchers and for scientific community to achieve more plans for registration and mitigation. Finally, for strategy establishment of national coordination units for cooperation between national authorities and stockholders impacted by ocean acidification and climate change, build regional bioeconomic modeling tools to support forecasting expected impacts on marine life and the resulting consequences for at-risk stakeholders. Co-design strategies identifying research and policy needs by close cooperation with local communities support co-management approach between local governments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naima. Excellent. It's really nice to see the, the strategy policy research needs written down to, to give us a vision for where it is we need to be moving towards. Thank you very much for that. So next I'd like to offer the floor to Jana Friedrich. Thank you, Steve. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the uh, International uh, Coordination Center on Ocean Acidification. Um, it was at the Rio Plus 20 Summit when the uh, IAEA's Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center was launched. That was in 2012. And since then, it's funded by the US through a Peace for Uses initiative project of the IAEA. And we are very grateful for this constant funding by, by the US. So it was, it was launched because the member states realized the need for coordinated action on ocean acidification because there were a lot of concerns growing about the increasing ocean acidification. And the aim of the center is to coordinate activities worldwide, but also to raise awareness and uh, do capacity building, both regional uh, and, and also on, on the global level, and also to organize um, training courses. And we have three pillars. So one is the communication dissemination pillar. We have a data hub, we have a literature hub where people get, can get information through web services. We do a lot of capacity building, both uh, virtual, online, but also hands-on training, both at the IEA Marine Laboratories in Monaco, but also at the member states. And we are doing science. We're doing research for our member countries and here we are use our unique uh, facilities using uh, isotopes and radionuclides. So one example is we are using calcium 45 to uh, to assess the calcification and the 
how calcification is affected in shelled organisms by ocean acidification. So the capacity building is a central uh, point of the uh, OICC. And it is a capacity building done tailored to the needs of the member states. So as I said, both in the member states itself as also in our laboratories. It, we have training courses on different uh, levels. Uh, we do with our member states better development. So we develop with them research kits and best practices and implement them. And, uh, we enable the participation of uh, scientists at international meetings. One example is the, uh, the meeting we had in Peru on, uh, on the ocean in a high CO2 world that took place in September this year. And we do a lot of regional coordination and collaboration, so we are supporting both regional observation networks and also we collaborating with the Global Ocean Acidification Observation Network. We do, as I said, a lot of capacity building. So since the uh, launch to, uh, 10 years ago, we had 900 capacity building opportunities for more than 800 scientists from 110 countries. Um, to give you one example, uh, we did a level one training course in, in, in Sweden earlier this year and the participants apply for this course and the, the participant is funded through the OICC. It was uh, organized uh, with, together with the University in Gothenburg, the Swedish Royal Academy of Science and the North Atlantic Hub of Goa and it took place at the Christina Berg uh, research station in Sweden. And just uh, a few, few weeks ago, or one week ago, we finished a level two training building on this previous course. It was a basic training course on multiple stressors in Monaco and in Villefranche uh, Marine Station. Thank you very much for the opportunity that our participants could do uh, training uh, on board uh, a little vessel. And uh, we did it also in support with the Prince Albert Foundation and with uh, OASIS. And here the participants, uh, all early career scientists, learned the effect of uh, multiple stressors. So a system <coughs> that has already, is already stressed due to acidification is of course more vulnerable to additional stressors like, for example, pollution or eutrophication, just to give you one example. And that's basically it in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jana. I, 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 don't think, I can't stress enough really how important the work of the OAICC is. I mean, it's clear when we look at climate change and the multiple stressors, we've got a huge amount of work to do and we have a very limited amount of time and resource to be able to do it. The, the work you do in building capacity and bringing people together in partnerships and collaborations is just, it, it's just critical to be able to get us to deliver the vision of, of creating the, the, the knowledge and science we need to really adapt and mitigate to the challenges we face. So I'd really like to add my thanks to the work that's done as part of that initiative. So thank you very much. Next, I'd like to pass the floor over to Nick Harbour and Mountford. Thank you, Steve. Um, in the words of Pablo Neruda, I need the sea, it teaches me. And I think ocean acidification science is one of the areas where we've really listened to the ocean. We understood there was a problem, set up global monitoring networks to go on, uh, really started to get an idea of the, the big scale picture of the problem. and, and and, and the sort of species and ecosystems and what they're telling us, you know, whether it's pteropods in the Antarctic or whatever, you know, but, and, and so we understand this problem. But the challenge we have now is what do we do about it? And, and I think, you know, I'm encouraged from what I'm seeing here today. I mean, the, the, the sort of plans Egypt has for really building infrastructure and addressing the challenge of ocean acidification. The, the coordination and capacity building that's going on from um, IEA. And 
you know, and, and us working together as a community on this. But the conversation is still dominated by a few voices. And it's really important that the capacity we have reaches across the world, particularly into the global south, um, to build the marine science capacity, but also to build the capacity for making policy decisions that will allow us to address the impacts of ocean acidification and how we build resilience um, in coastal ecosystems. That requires understanding regional variability, understanding the difference between ocean acidification and stressed ecosystems versus pristine ecosystems, um, and how we can rebuild that resilience in the stressed ecosystems. And so in the, in the Commonwealth, um, we, we have a community in the Commonwealth Blue Charter, 56 countries who have signed up to um, taking action on the ocean um, co cooperatively. Um, and um, we have 10 action groups taking that work forward. New Zealand champions the action group on ocean acidification. And in 2019, we had a great workshop in Otago and, and talked through all these issues around how we translate ocean acidification science into policy and what we can do about it. And then on the back of that, um, last year we released um, a handbook, a policymaker's handbook for ocean acidification to really um, translate um, the science through a framework for analysis into um, actions that policymakers can take. Um, so, so I would encourage you to look at that resource. Um, we've also been working with the Ocean Foundation to roll out the Go On in a Box um, kits um, together with sort of the, the Pacific program that New Zealand's being, been working on and um, working with Canada, the champions on ocean observation, to put that into the Caribbean as well. And um, again, that's about building the regional capacity, building those um, observations at a local scale and building the scientific capacity to use it. Um, I wanted to highlight from an African perspective, uh, we also, the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association has actually got some really good um, marine s uh, capacity for ocean acidification, but again, they need the equipment, they need more support to develop this. Um, and so, I, th I think we are building a good global network. Um, the ORS project um, under the um, UN Decade of Marine Science for Sustainable Development, so that's Ocean Acidification Research for Sustainability, um, has its seven outcome areas that translate everything from, from, from doing the science, predicting uh, the future impacts, to translating that science to policy makers and then uh, building effective policy on it. And so we've got these seven working groups now trying to take this forward at a global scale as well. Um, I'd encourage all of you to get involved and um, really see how we can work together to continue listening to the ocean and uh, giving back to the ocean what is needed. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, and I think, I think one of the points you raised there uh, is really key, and I'd just like to re-emphasize it. Uh, it, it. We've done a lot of science over the last 20 years understanding what ocean acidification is, what the likely impacts are. I think the phase we now are in is, is we're establishing the vision of what the future is that we want. You know, we, we've seen a future that we don't want. We've seen a future that scares us greatly. And now it's about understanding the direction of travel we do want to take and understanding the actions we need to take now and the capacity we need to build to allow us to travel along that road to the future where we want to be. And uh, you mentioned the AWARS program under the UN Ocean Decade. And, and I would hope that on behalf of the community, we can pick up that, that roadmap, that vision, and really starting to implement the ambitions that's laid out in that community. And it's going to take all of us to be able to realize those ambitions. So um, it's an exciting uh, time of opportunities, but it's an opportunity that we could let pass if we're not, if we're not careful. So thank you for highlighting that. And it gives, now gives me great pleasure to welcome to the floor uh, Tarika Tamari, who who represents a, a viewpoint of, of um, communities who are, who are at the very front line of the challenges we're facing with ocean acidification. I'm very much looking forward to hearing your perspectives on this. I think maybe you might have a, oh, you have a microphone there that you might be able to use that one. And I'm not sure if it, it's the I, uh, Today I will be presenting on the 
a, a brief overview of the current uh, program. The current program that we're currently working in co collaboration with the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment uh, Program, which is prep in, in small and the USP, as well as the Pacific community in, in building resilience to ocean acidification in the Pacific community communities. The project is funded uh, by the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the government of the principal principality of the Monaco. The PPOA project, we call it in short, was developed to address uh, the needs identified during the uh, third UN Small Island Developing States uh, Conference held in Napier since 2014. This is a regional uh, project which is uh, not on, only targeting Kiribati, but there are other two islands, Pacific Islands, that were identified as pilot islands for the, this project. And the, 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 the project ob objectives was uh, worked around four objectives, which is mainly focused on the research and monitoring, capacity building and awareness raising, policy support and some of the practical adaptation actions to ocean acidification. Under the, the current program that we're currently uh, working on addressing ocean acidification in Kiribati, these are the following activities that we come to uh, implement in, on, at the national level. Bef uh, firstly, we conducted a consultation in, with relevant stakeholders to identify potential uh, pilot sites, especially on South Tarao, the capital of Kiribati. Then we consult the, carry out the consultation and public awareness on the pilot site, targeting mainly the communities where we uh, implement this uh, project. In collaboration with the SPREP, we conduct an initial marine survey at this uh, specific site of the project, and then we develop some awareness materials uh, in our own local language where they, our communities could understand what is ocean acidification and what are the impacts. And from there, we, uh, uh, we develop some of the adaptation measures, and they, that include uh, coral planting, seagrass planting, mangrove planting, and the next uh, steps will be the monitoring and evaluation would be uh, uh, earmarked to be implemented later this year. Some of the outcomes uh, of the activities that we come to notice is the establishment of the locally managed marine areas on the pilot site that we uh, identified as the, the site for the project working closely with the communities on the, the site. Secondly, we also managed to develop a management plan for the, this uh, newly established um, MPA with the community. And we're now trying to expand this program throughout the outer islands, because as you may understand, Kiribati is made up of uh, 33 atolls, islands, scattered around the, the vast ocean of the 3.5 million square kilometers of the EEZ. And we also managed to develop a video clip on uh, ocean acidification awareness to communities, which give us uh, the, the which this video we're now trying to uh, showcase it throughout the islands that we come to uh, visit on the implementing this uh, OA program. And also we, we managed to develop a short video clip on coral planting activities that we've done around the, the, the islands that we visited to implement such program. That's all from my side, and these are sort of some of the, the snapshot of what we've been doing on coral planting, using different methods of uh, 
our coral planting in Kiribati. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that fantastic presentation. I would, I'd just like to say that um, in, t in terms of the, uh, the research, the energy, the, the creativity and the innovation that I've seen through, um, through working with colleagues in the, in the Pacific, through the, the Pacific Islands uh, Ocean Acidification Regional Hub as part of GOAN, it's, it's, it's amazed, it's amazed me just how, how much energy and innovation there is in dealing with this issue in that area. And, and, and the efforts in terms of capacity building and in, in dissemination of information and, and the direct link between scientific evidence and interpolicy, really understanding what the issue is and, and taking constructive steps towards trying to address those issues, I think actually the Pacific region it, it, sh it should be looked upon as, a, as leading very much in terms of how to, how to stand up in front of and address the issue of ocean acidification. So we thank you for that leadership in that area and, and, and I continue to look forward to working with the Pacific Island uh, nations in, 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 that, in that fight against ocean acidification. Now we'd, I'd like to move on to, to Sarah Kapnick from NOAA, and again through my through um, my interactions with the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, I'd like to thank NOAA for your ongoing and continued support in terms of supporting that initiative, both financially and also in terms of the the conceptual support of the the network itself, and also the capacity building efforts that you you help support through that as well not least with also the, the frontline research that you fund uh, in North America and in other parts of the world as well. So I'd like to offer you the floor to give us your uh, insights and um, ideas around the topic of ocean acidification and other multiple stressors. Yes, thank you for having us here. To fighting climate change and limiting its impacts must include the world's oceans. The ocean plays an essential role in climate regulation, but also provides solutions for mitigation as well as adaptation. The IPCC recently reported that sea level rise, ocean warming, acidification, and deoxygenation will continue to happen well into the 21st century, and we can limit it based on the future of emissions. Yet despite these dire warnings from the IPCC, the impacts of ongoing ocean warming, acidification, deoxygenation are often under-recognized, misunderstood, or not reflected across mainstream climate mitigation or adaptation priorities. The disconnect between the scientific evidence that our group, as well as others at this um, panel today, have shown um, res results in a um, uh, sorry, conservation and management tools um, are required. We need to have marine park protected areas, ecosystem and habitat restoration efforts, nature-based solutions, and climate resilient fisheries and aquaculture front and center in our solutions planning. The good news is that if we act now, we can make a difference. We must continue to achieve significant reductions of greenhouse gas and carbon emissions, and the most important step in turning the tide of climate impacts on our oceans. Additionally, we can take a no regrets approach to supporting adaptation and resilience. This means supporting targeted science that helps decision makers and coastal communities increase biodiversity and improve adaptive capacity. Both the US federal government and US states are accelerating our on the ground actions that provide solutions and address increasing ocean impacts. Federally, the US has led and climate ocean change knowledge and response through creation of the Biden administration's Ocean Climate Action Plan, EPA's National Estuary Program, and NOAA's Ocean and Acidification Program. Created in 2009, our Ocean Acidification Program expanded nationwide for research and monitoring, enabling regions to develop baseline knowledge for local response and management. We're investing in our regional ocean and coastal acidification networks that foster collaborations across academic institutions, federal and state agencies, tribal governments, and a variety of stakeholders and non-governmental organizations. We need to advance monitoring, identification, and filling our knowledge gaps, and to educate communities and stakeholders about the issues of climate-related ocean change at regional scale. Importantly, the U.S. Ocean Acidification Interagency Working Group is conducting a nationwide vulnerability study. 
From this, it will guide future investments and support adaptation and resilience measures across the most vulnerable sections and communities. At the congressional level, our bipartisan legislation, like the Coast and Ocean Acidification and Threats Research Act, provide assistance for coastal communities to be able to deal with these issues. Historic infrastructure investment through the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act help us upgrade and modernize wastewater and stormwater systems, systems which reduce local and land-based source contributions of pollution, with verge, which further exacerbate coastal warming, acidification, and deoxygenation. Monitoring these wastewaters is really critical in coastal zones to ensure healthy ecosystems. The Act provides significant resources, including $2.6 billion to restore and protect coastal ecosystems, among other priorities. Shoreline restoration activities and habitat protection of aquatic vegetation, including kelp, seagrasses, and salt marshes, can sequester carbon and provide nature-based solutions against ongoing climate ocean change. At the international level, I am proud to say the U.S. is now an official member of the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification, and as a member, we are committed to implementing our own Ocean Acidification Action Plan in the U.S. Facilitated through this alliance, our national, subnational, regional, and tribal governments are proactively responding to the impacts of ocean acidification as they create their plans to effectively promote solutions and advance our knowledge on action, and then be able to share it with all of our partners. Our unique national action plan builds on more than a decade of research at NOAA. And combined, it will accelerate monitoring of all large marine ecosystems, support management of our resources, expand our understanding of marine resources that are being affected by acidification and other climate structures. It will also identify potential mitigation tools, which might include some marine carbon dioxide removal strategies. The key is to create the science and have sound science as we develop that out in that space. We also plan to support the ongoing reductions of greenhouse gas and carbon emissions from all U.S. sources and expand our engagement with communities within the United States, but also globally. Finally, the U.S. is a founding partner of the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. As we've heard about today, it is this network supports a network of nine regional hubs engaged in building capacity for ocean and coastal monitoring and research to inform effective responses to climate change and its impacts. This network recently led the development of the UN Decade Endorsed Ocean Acidicated Research for Sustainability Program, which aims to strengthen the capacity of governments and stakeholders worldwide to be able to respond effectively to the multiple threats of climate change to marine ecosystems and also human communities that depend on them. While critical gaps in our knowledge remains, we know enough to begin prioritizing and exploring the questions of the most relevant to policymakers, seafood industry, and local communities. We will continue on our science, but directionally we know what we must do going forward. It is important to successful mitigation and adaptation efforts that governments and non-government act actors understand the suite of regional or national monitoring research and adaptation activities that can now be implemented at various scales. By integrating climate and ocean science, management and investment, we are demonstrating the types of actions required today to be able to deliver ambitious high-level commitments through the Paris Climate Agreement and the UN Sustainable Development Goal Agenda, and we are calling on our national and subnational government partners to do the same. I am proud to say that the US is leading the way, ensuring that climate and ocean science policies and investments accurately reflect this importance going forward. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. And, and yep. yes, a round of applause. For that. And, and I, I, for one, would also like to reiterate the fact that um, through my interactions with Goan and through various other interactions with NOAA, what's clear is that you know, often talk can be cheap. But, but NOAA is an organization that has demonstrated international leadership by doing, not just talking. And I think your actions have, have spoken loudly across the world and been exemplary in terms of trying to ensure that robust, reliable science, high quality science is used at, at, at for, for underpinning effective decision making and policy. 
and it's certainly a, a benchmark for, for how we want to move forward. So I think, I think NOAA's continued support, I think NOAA for your continued support and also your leadership in this area. Thank you. Now I move on to our final speaker, uh, and actually someone I, I would like to thank for at least challenging me and others as a marine scientists to think a bit differently. In it, through its role in, in the um, UN de Ocean Decade, uh, the Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, it really did challenge marine scientists to think more than just about the science we did. But why was it we're actually doing that science? What's the purpose? What is it we are trying to achieve? What is the future we want? And I think the UN Decade has been and will be instrumental in how we frame and how we design and how we implement our science so that it goes beyond just great science. It becomes an effective tool for change. So I thank you for leading us on that journey and I look forward to hearing a little bit more about that from you now. Thank you. So over to you, Julian. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for responding to the challenge. <laughs> That's great. But let me start maybe with a blunt statement. I think uh, ocean acidification is there to stay. So, you know, with the ocean, which is basically absorbing 25% of annual emissions of CO2, we're not going to curb that just in one day. And even if CO2 emissions are curbed through those agreements and negotiations, we have to deal with it and we have to get prepared for it. And I would really like to you know, introduce that concept of preparedness, which could be taken from the, uh, you know, maybe the, the disaster risk management community and, and really tr try to think how we could apply that in that concept, of course, of, you know, a much slower uh, hazard, but still a hazard to, uh, to, to coastal com communities. The second point is I think ocean acidification is having a, a systemic impact on the whole uh, ecosystem services. And therefore, we need to have an integrated approach that really engages not just science, but the socioeconomic actors, the policymakers, and the managers of resources uh, you know, at the national level in particular. So the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission has been working on ocean acidification for over 20 years. And you know, I have my colleague here, Kirsten, who's been uh, you know, the, 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 the leader of, uh, of that work uh, with the Global Ocean uh, Observatory go on the ocean acidification network um, but I think it's important to 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 realize that you know it took some time it took some time to really get the science right to get the the, the you know the synthesis of knowledge and uh, remember back in the years 2000 where some of those issues were actually brought up to the to the IOC to have a bit of a intergovernmental discussion about these issues and, and what was required in terms of research collaboration amongst nations. And uh, indeed, that, that actually led to the establishment of a Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network back in 2012. And basically, that provided us a strong basis for advocating for a specific sustainable development goal target on ocean acidification, recognizing that kind of cross-cutting impact of ocean acidification across the whole ecosystem, um, marine ecosystem. So Go On, I think, is, uh, is, is still a, a very strong platform, um, and you know IOC has been supporting it, and it's part of its secretariat and since 2017. We have about 1,000 members uh, that basically show how global collaboration helped to improve our understanding of the present and the future state of the ocean. It provides basically the basis for the evidence uh, to, to, to policy makers. We need the global pictures, but as we have heard also, we also need to have a local picture in terms of what's happening. Uh, and, you know, several of you have mentioned the, uh, uh, this new initiative under the Ocean Decade, the Ocean Acidification Research for Sustainability, which I think is really the missing uh, link, because we've, as we said, we have a, a strong um, background in terms of developing the knowledge and so on, but now we need to, to, to use that knowledge and translate it into a concrete action and really uh, uh, in order to have a good understanding of uh, you know, this, the sustainability of marine uh, ecosystems and what are the thresholds, what are the tipping points, uh, what type of ecosystems are going to be more vulnerable, what kind of scenarios are we able to build with this science to really uh, inform um, you know, local, local processes, coastal management, marine spatial planning, fisheries policies, um, and, and so on. 
we still need to increase the observations because uh, you know we we still have major uh, parts of the world that are underobserved, and that requires investment as well from from member states. Uh, it requires investments from international donors to build and and, and and sustain that network because sustaining is actually the the key word here. Um, I think. In ORs, what's really the, the, the transformative approach is really to try to have a, a early on a dialogue with policymakers, and, and, and that's really the spirit of the Ocean Decade as well. This concept of co-design and engaging them in a, you know setting some of the research objectives uh, together with the scientists, and I think that that's that's you know that, that's pretty in, innovative. Um, I think we need to also look at the evaluation of strategies for offsetting future impacts of ocean investigation, and OAS is going to do that. So that's that's also very important, so that we not only advocate and understand the problem, but we need to come up also with potential solutions uh, to to those changes that are going to happen. So, just want to highlight that you know we, as IOC, as a coordinator of the Ocean Decade, we you know we very much. Uh, you know, support this program, and I particularly want to thank the, you know, the UST, the, the, the Plymouth Lab, and, and of course IUC is a, is a member also, is a, is a leader of that initiative in its own right. Um, I think we need to use the decade framework, uh, you know, to, to also connect with other parts of the, the marine environment. We have 10 decade challenges in the, um, you know, in the, the, the implementation plan of the decade. We have a one that's focusing on the uh, ocean and climate nexus, so there is a clear uh, aspect there, but there's also one related to uh, ecosystem resilience, there's one related to uh, the blue economy, and I think through, through those you know, communities of practice that we are building, we have now more than you know, 43 international programs, we have 150 projects set up under the decade, we can create those connections and those collaborations, and we can also build that capacity which is so needed uh, to, to you know to 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 to, to deliver on, on the ground, so I think I'm I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, this work is going to result in a in, in really potential strong change uh, on, on on the ground. So thanks again. Thank you very much, Julian. That that concludes the interventions from the the panelists. So um, before I launch into a few questions I have. I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to um, just open the floor. If there's any questions from the floor, if you have any questions for any of our speakers. Jean-Pierre? Maybe uh, just a few comments. Uh, the first one um, about NOAA. NOAA was really instrumental to uh, open this uh, Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. There was uh, someone at the Bureau of International Affairs, his name escapes my memory, who has been a key uh, person here. And so thank you, Noah, for that. Um, I'd like to make uh, one uh, small uh, correction to what you said, uh, Julian. Um, uh, ocean Acidification is here to stay. That's not quite correct, because if the Paris Agreement is implemented, and if we I know that uh, this is a big if. Um, the uh, RCP 2.6 um, sen uh, emission scenario shows that uh, ocean acidification can be completely stopped. Of course, uh, the acidity level of the ocean will remain as is, uh, so there is no reversal back in time, but uh, ocean acidification, that is the increase in ocean acidity, can be completely um, brought to an end. So that's. Uh, good news if uh, those uh, negotiators next door uh, uh, do some progress. And on that account, I, I agree with everything which has been said, and uh, it, there is a lot to do in terms of adaptation, but really the key uh, is mitigation. And I'm, I'm quite concerned about uh, the fact that uh, geoengineering approaches are being pushed uh, in the negotiating rooms. Um, ocean fertilization, for example, or carbon dioxide removal, I think it is very dangerous to put the future of the ocean on such prospects, uh, which we don't even know how it works, we don't even know how to implement uh, those things, and uh, 
not, uh, and of course the worst is uh, solar uh, radiation management, which uh, will do nothing to solve uh, the uh, ocean acidification issue. So I think it is very critical that uh, as a community, we continue to push um, the mitigation issue because without pushing that, uh, all adaptation measures will become really not useless, but uh, will have uh, very little efficiency. So thank you very much for organizing this uh, session. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. I, I think you raise a very, very important issue here. I mean, it is clear that in terms of ocean acidification, we, we kind of sit in a car that's traveling towards an impending accident. In fact, the accident may well have already started for some people. And unless we start reducing emissions, we are continually sitting there with our foot on the gas going faster and faster and faster. And yes, there may be opportunities at local or regional scales to try to mitigate some of the worst impacts through other measures. Um, but in essence, that's just fitting a few seat belts and a few uh, airbags that might work, might not work. At the end of the day, we need, to, we need to take the speed out of this vehicle and we need to slow those emissions. It should be our primary objective. We, sh we, need to, we need to stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and I completely agree with you, our main focus should be on that. I also think that some of the partnerships, the communities, the relationships, the structures, the networks we now have created to, to understand science can be brought to bear to really understand the risks associated with some of these proposals. And we must not launch into interactions which which we don't fully understand, I believe. So I, I know that maybe you want to make a comment and then I'll come back to Nick. Yeah, I would say that the ocean is also a really special place where we have this international cooperation in a lot of our science that we're doing, both for understanding the effects of climate change, but also understanding the adaptation with local communities that we work with around the world around that. And so as a scientific organization, NOAA is really committed to understanding what the future effects are and communicating those broadly across the world, but also the adaptation measures that we need to start taking. Um, because we're seeing these effects growing, um, particularly in food security and potential impacts on local foods in the coastal zones. And so we are working really strongly on trying to make sure that we are getting the information out on how to mitigate those effects um, that can happen in those coastal zones to be able to have changes to be able to increase coastal resilience, increase um, the health of the ecosystems along the coast, which we're seeing increasingly is an important factor in food security, particularly in developing nations, and we have partnerships around the world on the science and translating that science. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so uh, absolutely fantastic points, JP. And um, I think we've got to, but on the adaptation side, um, the, the countries, so in the Commonwealth, we have 45% of the world's coral reefs, for example. Most of the countries that have those are not the ones contributing to the, the problem, mainly. And, you know, so, 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 so there's a disconnect between the emitters and those suffering the, the impacts at the forefront of ocean acidification. And so there needs to be adaptation action now. And, and we need to recognize this is cross-sectoral. We can do things now like reducing agricultural emissions and runoff it, um, in rivers that is polluting estuaries, that is causing localized acidification and stress to systems um, that will build resilience in those systems and give us more time until it, you know, we can stabilize atmospheric emissions. So it's really important that we see these things working hand in hand um, and that um, the, the, while we still push very hard for the global mitigation, we've got to put these adaptation efforts in place because if we wait till 2050 and we hit net zero, um, God willing, you know, it's too late to start adapting then. We've got to be doing it now. Um, I think what you'd raised about the um, uh, carbon dioxide sequestration, geoengineering stuff is, is really important. We need to be very clear that and again, as with ocean acidification, giving very clear scientific advice about what works and what doesn't. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, particularly with the, the rise of carbon credits, 
trading platforms. There's all this sort of discussion on what money can be made by, by sequestering carbon in the ocean and, you know, sinking kelp and um, sargassum and so on. And, and, you know, the science has come out of the modeling showing that if we were to do that at large scale, we'd use the whole oxygen budget of the ocean. We have to be very clear we would kill the ocean by doing that. And that would kill, you know, life on this planet. I mean, we, they, we, these are the sort of drastic things we're talking about. So the science needs to be very clear that comes out because a lot of countries as well are looking for um, financing solutions to, to help them adapt to climate change. And if carbon credits seem a great way of doing it, you know, they're, they're going to sign up to these schemes without fully understanding the implications. So let's leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm tapping on what uh, Niklas just uh, started to mention. We also need to look into rivers and estuaries because we need to look where also in, in, re in the several regions uh, sources for acidific acidification come from. For example, eutrophied systems, eutrophied estuaries contribute to ocean acidification. And that uh, touches a general problem. We as scientists, we need to work across geographical boundaries. So not just focusing on the ocean, but also on, on the land, on the land-based sources. And we need to work across discipline boundaries, so inte integrating uh, social sciences. But also we need to communicate what we are doing. It's, it's not enough that we are writing or producing sound uh, science and writing scientific papers. We should also change a little bit our focus and use part of our time to communicate what we are doing because all these decision makers in the negotiation rooms they won't le or most of them won't read scientific papers and they're not supposed to so we need to better communicate it in addition to uh, raise the capacity in the member states so I really would like to ask us scientists I'm including myself to use more time and effort to communicate what we are doing, why we are doing, what are the, uh, what, what are the effects of ocean acidification and other climate change issues. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll do a shameless plug for the Ocean Acidification um, Research for Sustainability Program in that one of our seven outcomes is around um, achieving a ocean acidification literate society and this isn't about making ocean acidification experts out of everyone this is about empowering people to have a more educated and nuanced conversation so they can be part of those conversations so when solutions are being created they are be they are able to contribute to those conversations in a much more informed way and i think that fits with the um julian's point about Co-development. Co-development is not just about co-developing things with funders and about policy makers. It's about co-developing it with the people who are going to have to live with those solutions and deal with those solutions as they are implemented on the ground. Uh, I'm just conscious of the time. Are we reaching the end? Okay. So I would like to thank all of the panelists for your insights into this topic. It's been fantastic to hear them. And it's been really great to have that conversation towards the end. I thank you all for your leadership and your efforts in this topic. Uh, it is clear that the ocean acidification community is broad, it's diverse, it's committed, it's enthusiastic, it's innovative. And it fills me with great hope that we've got so many people working so hard to deliver what the Ocean Decade says is we, we deliver the ocean that we want, the ocean that we dream of. Um, and we understand the steps that we have to take to get there. And we put those steps into action. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us here this morning. And I wish you all a very successful remaining COP and look forward to working with all of you in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>